Psalm chapter 92. Psalm chapter 92. We've been going through the Psalms for several months, not going in sequential order and covering every single one, but just kind of highlighting some various ones as we've gone through and we've found our way here to Psalm chapter 92. Uh, last week, as, as we have been going through these psalms, we've been highlighting some various themes. Um, and as we've been highlighting themes, we started to turn our focus towards Thanksgiving. Obviously, as we are in the month of November and as we are rapidly approaching the holiday of Thanksgiving, uh, we want to shift our focus towards that topic uh, because many things now are trying to take the holiday of Thanksgiving and even turn them away from things like thankfulness and turn it more towards various things like football or food or spending time with other people, which are not necessarily bad things, in many cases good things, but we would like to obviously keep the focus on the purpose of Thanksgiving, and that is giving thanks to God for what he has blessed us with and what he's given to us and how he's been so good to us over the past year. Uh, and the way that we had been starting to turn that focus on Thanksgiving has been focusing on God and focusing particularly on some of the attributes of God. As I think about Thanksgiving and as we start to ponder Thanksgiving, there are two avenues that I find many people can take when it comes to this idea of thanksgiving or giving thanks or expressing gratitude. I believe that there is an active approach and there is a passive approach to, to thanksgiving. And I feel as we observe most people and as even I observe my own life and, and think about how, how people express gratitude, how people express giving thanks and thanksgiving, it seems that most people take a passive approach to it. Um, and as we think of, well, what is a passive approach to Thanksgiving? What does it mean to be passively thankful or, or having this type of attitude? And as we kind of look at it, a, a passive approach to Thanksgiving tends to be more of a circumstantial, reactionary approach to giving thanks, to being grateful for showing thanksgiving in our lives. This type of approach, a passive approach, is the expressing of, of thanksgiving, the giving of thanks, when good things happen to us in our lives, right? And obviously this is a good time to show thanksgiving when things happen in our lives that are good, um, whether it be various successes that we may have in our life, whether maybe it's a promotion at work or a job well done at work or things are going well in our home life or, or we overcome a particular battle that we've been having um, or you know, we obtain new things that we're thankful for. Maybe we are able to acquire a new car or a new vehicle in some way um, or we, we get a new item of clothing, uh, something along those lines of something that's new that we're thankful for. Sometimes we're circumstantially thankful for the avoidance of bad things. Maybe we were driving on the road and we avoided an accident and we're thankful for that. Maybe we were around someone who you know, may have gotten sick and we're thankful that we didn't catch that cold that they may have had and were, were healthy. Maybe, again, the, the avoidance of various things that may be deemed as bad in our life we avoid and we're thankful for that and it's good to be thankful for that but with the passive approach this is really the only time that thanksgiving is given when things happen to us that we deem really is good so this approach tends to lead to a very cyclical expression of thanksgiving because we know that life isn't all good that things aren't always progressing upward in our lives, but rather we have highs in our lives, we have lows in our lives, right? We use the illustration of getting that new car. Well, why do we need that new car? Well, because the last car broke down, right? So we have that low and then it goes to a high and then it, it, it's, it cycles back and forth. So when we think of this type of, of passive Thanksgiving, it, it is a very cyclical where we have times 
um, where we're very thankful and times where we're not thankful. And it's not that we're not being actively thankful of things, it's just more we're not thinking about it. So the danger with this tends to be is that we're tying our thankfulness to our perceived happiness, right? Things that make us happy, things that we're, we're happy about or glad about, this is a reason to give thanks. Now, is that how Thanksgiving is supposed to work? Are we only supposed to be giving thanks when we're happy, when things are going good? You know, we even think, should we have these seasons of thankfulness and seasons where we're potentially not thankful? Is that a model that we should be living? The biblical answer to that is no. We should not be living in a cyclical type of thanksgiving where we're only thankful during the highs and then we're not thankful during the lows. Um, but rather, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 tells us, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of Christ Jesus concerning you. So the biblical approach to thanksgiving is not this real passive approach that as circumstance has it and as we're happy as things are progressing in our lives, that this is the only time that we give thanksgiving. But rather that the verse in 1 Thessalonians very clearly tells us that in everything, in everything give thanks. So the alternative to passive thanksgiving is active thanksgiving. And this, very simply, to put it, is actively seeking ways and searching for areas in which we can be thankful. Where it's not we are just letting life come at us and as we identify things that make us happy, that's, as, that's how we give thanks. But rather actively being thankful no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in. No matter what is happening in our lives, we are seeking to be thankful and having a thankful attitude and showing forth thanksgiving. But what makes this difficult, because it sounds good in theory, it sounds like it, it's something that we can sustain, but what makes this difficult is our tendency towards being more passively thankful. As humans, we have a tendency to move towards this passive thanksgiving. And that is, again, being our thankfulness is dependent on our circumstances and our position and our happiness. Because the issue that we find with this is that our circumstances and our position are, are constantly changing. Thus, the source of our thanksgiving is varied. So if we're going to seek to unlock true, consistent, active thanksgiving... This means that we need to anchor our thanksgiving into a source that's not varied, that's not going to be changing, that doesn't have ups and downs like we may have in our lives and, and things that may only just be happy things in our lives, but rather we need to be anchoring it to something that doesn't change, that is consistent, that, that we can, can rely on. Now, people may question if there is such a thing as an invariable source in our lives. Because what doesn't change in our lives? Right? Life consists of change all the time. You can't avoid change. You can't even fight against change because change is just the natural progression in our lives. Everything changes, and we can all bear witness to that, that as we go through our life, there are things that change. So what isn't subject to the highs and lows of life? Well, to the unsaved soul, the answer is nothing. But to those who are saved, the answer is God. God is that invariable source. God is that unwavering source. Not only as a presence in our life, but also in his character and in his action. Everything about God is consistent. Thus, if we turn to God in our thanksgiving, and we are actively expressing thankfulness both to and through God, we will not see the variance in our thanksgiving. This allows us to have this active thanksgiving that no matter what circumstance we find ourselves in, whether good or whether in a bad circumstance, 
we can give thanks. We can be thankful. We can show forth thanksgiving. And honestly, we see models throughout Scripture all the time of servants of God who were in terrible circumstances, even to the point where they are about to be killed, yet they are still expressing thanksgiving. They are still being thankful. They're still praising God for what is happening in their lives, even though their circumstance is not one that would be showing forth happiness. But that's because their thankfulness is anchored in God. It's not anchored in their circumstances, not anchored even in their own life, but rather it is outside of that, and they're actively being thankful in God. The issue that we run into, because again, it all sounds good when we just say it like this, but the issue that oftentimes you run into is that it's difficult for us to take the attention off of ourselves. It's difficult for us to take the attention off of our circumstances because they're so present in our lives. It's difficult for us to take that step back and get the wide view approach of seeing really the whole picture. Because again, we're going through it on a day-to-day -day basis. We're going through our struggles. We're going through the difficult times. So how do we continue to have this active approach? We, need, we know that this active approach can only come by anchoring our thankfulness in God. But how do we keep that attention on God and keeping it away from ourselves? The solution to that is to fill our minds with God. If our mind is being preoccupied with God, if our mind is being filled with God and God's goodness and, and, the, and the attributes of God that we've already looked at some and how we're going to look at some this morning, then we mitigate much of ourselves in our own thinking. We lessen oftentimes a lot of the circumstances because we have such a high view of God. But nevertheless, this is still a spiritual discipline. It takes discipline to be in the Word of God. It takes discipline to be filling our minds with God. To, to stop our, our lives and say, you know what? I need to fill my mind with God. I need to be in His Word. I need to be praying to Him. I need to have more God in my life. I need to be super saturated with His Word and His, His way and Him just as God. So this morning, let's fill our mind with God from Psalm chapter 92. And as we do so, we're going to see four ways in which we can be thankful. Four things that we can be thankful for. So the first thing that we'll be looking at this morning is thankful for God's character. Thankful for God's character. We see this in the first three verses of Psalm 92. It says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. And to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. To show forth thy loving kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings, and upon a psaltery, upon the harp, with a solemn sound. We see that the psalmist here in Psalm 92 begins by establishing the fact that it is a good thing to give thanks and to sing to God. To sing praises to God. Now, again, we, we understand this as a concept, right? Yeah, of course it's a good thing to give thanks. Of course it's a good thing to sing. So in concept, yes, we recognize that this is a good thing. But not only is it a good thing as a concept, but it's also a good thing in practice. It's something that should be practiced. It's not just this concept that's floating out there, and it's good because the concept is good, but it's also good as we establish it in our lives. This is actually really what brings that goodness out, is the fact that we are actively giving thanks, that we are singing to God. And we need to remember that when we give thanks and we sing to God, not only is it something that is deemed good as far as being good on a moral compass, right? If we have a moral compass and it's turned by things that are good or bad, and we, we, we point the compass at, at giving thanks and singing praises to God, and it, it deems it good because the moral compass said so, but it's also good for us. It's good for us. We find benefit in giving thanks. We find benefit in singing. We find benefit 
in praising God for who he is. So I think oftentimes we, we read these things, right? We read through the Psalms, we read the verse and say, it's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and sing praises unto thy name, O Most High. But we don't always make the connection that not only is it good from a moral standpoint, but it's good from a beneficial standpoint in our own lives. That the way that God has intended us to live, the way that God has intended to, uh, for us as func to function as human beings, is that we benefit from being thankful. We benefit from singing praises to God. That this allows us to benefit in our lives in multiple ways. And it makes you wonder, how much benefit are we potentially losing by not giving thanks? How much benefit are we losing by not opening our mouth to sin? Because we see that it's good. It's good for us to do so. And it's beneficial for us to do so. And it's a shame that we allow various things to detract from that benefit, to detract from that good thing that it is to give thanks and to sin. But then as we move into verse 2, we see the psalmist gives us two of God's character traits that should drive our thanksgiving. It says again, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Now, the, the context of this is this psalm is, is generally believed to be written as the children of Israel become established in the promised land. It says a psalm or a song for the Sabbath day is part of the description on the top of the psalm in, in my Bible. Um, and it's believed that it, it was written as a song that would be sung on the Sabbath as they're being established in the promised land. And how it would accompany morning and evening sacrifice. Thus show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. This song is being sung in those time periods. But I wanted to highlight those two things. Loving kindness and faithfulness. Because these are two very important attributes of God that lead to our thankfulness. And lead to our thanksgiving. Um... There are obviously plenty more of attributes that drive our thanksgiving, but these two are easy for us to recognize and to utilize. So let's first take a look at loving kindness. What is loving kindness? How do we define it? Because it's kind of like we've combined two words. Well, it is kind of a combination of two words of love and, and kindness together. But God's loving kindness can be described as the idea of, of faithful love and action. Of faithful love and action. It's frequently associated with forgiveness and is practically equivalent to mercy or mercifulness. It can also be viewed as God's gracious affection towards us in both blessings and providence, but also in grace that he extends towards us. So as we, we try to... to establish this understanding of God's loving kindness and as we try to establish how this even applies to us we begin to, to build the picture here that when we are giving thanks for God's loving kindness what we're truly being thankful for is God's love we're being thankful for God's forgiveness we're being thankful for God's mercy for his blessing for his providence, for his grace. These are so many areas that encompass our lives. And if you really start to, to practically dig into love and forgiveness and mercy and blessing and providence and grace, we see that these far extend past just the happy good times in our lives, but are also ever present and oftentimes more clearly present in the difficult times in our life. So we can think to ourselves, in what way has God loved me? In what way or ways has God forgiven me? How has God had mercy on me? 
How has God blessed me? How has he provided for me? How has he shown grace towards me in my life? And again, I think as we really start to dig into these things, we begin to, to build that complete picture of how we can have this active thanksgiving no matter what, because it's based in God. It's based in God's loving kindness. We're thankful for the character trait of his loving kindness because it shows forth to us the, the love that he has for us, the love that was extended towards us through his son and through a, a daily basis. We see the forgiveness that we have. We understand the forgiveness that we have, not only as being forgiven of our sin and the eternal penalty that sin bears, but also forgiven on a daily basis, allowing us to have fellowship with God. The mercy that he's had of withholding things that we rightfully deserve as sinners and withholding those things, or even the consequences of various things that may take place in our life. We can see how he blesses us on a daily basis, how his providential care for us extends not only in the good but the bad. And his grace that is bestowed to us, not only in salvation, but daily grace that allows us to get through every situation that he calls us to go through. It really is all-encompassing. Secondly, there's faithfulness. There's faithfulness. So we're thankful for his loving kindness, but we're also thankful for his faithfulness. Because God's faithfulness is really what drives his loving kindness and what separates God from man. Right? Because we understand that a lot of these things men can show in a very limited way, right? God can show love, or man can show love in a limited way. Man can forgive, man can show mercy, man can bless other people and provide for other people and, and have grace towards other people. But it's the faithfulness that God displays through all these things that separates him as God and worthy of our thanksgiving and our worship. Because God's faithfulness is unchanging. It's unwavering. It is constant. It does not fail. Now contrast that with mankind. Contrast that with man. Man changes all the time. Man wavers all the time. Man is inconsistent. He's not constant. And we know our own failures. God's faithfulness is a reason for gratitude and thanksgiving. In a world where people are not perfect and people are not faithful all the time, we can rejoice and be thankful that we have a God who is and that he's faithfully showing us all of these things that we just talked about in love and kindness. Again, couple these two things together. We're not going to take the time to to go through every single one of them and couple them together because we have limited time this morning that we're together. But think about it. Dwell on it. And I feel as we dwell on this, we can't help but to be thankful. We can't help but show thanksgiving in our lives as we dwell and meditate and ponder God's faithfulness and loving kindness. We can be thankful for God's character. Secondly, we see thankful for God's action. Thankful for God's action, verses 4 through 7. It says, For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. A unique aspect about God is that he plays an active role within creation. He works as a sovereign, providential God within his creation. This separates God from a lot of other false gods and other false religions. There are people that have even taken the aspect and believe that God 
may have created everything and he kind of wound it up like a clock and then took his hands off and he's just sitting back and letting things naturally go. But we see that that's not the case here. And that's not what God does. God is actively involved within his creation. He actively works. He does actions. He is sovereign and he is providential in these things. And the psalmist expresses that God's works have made him glad and that he will triumph through his works. Right? O Lord, or verse 4, thou, for thou, Lord, has made me glad through thy works. What God has done in the psalmist's life is leading to him being happy, is leading to him being glad. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. I will be successful because of this. What the psalmist is essentially saying is that our success in our lives and even our gladness and happiness in our lives is directly correlated to God's working in our lives. Which again should lead us thankful that we have a God that is sovereignly working. Because this is the key to not only our gladness and our happiness, but also the success. But a very important aspect that the psalmist makes that I think cause a lot of people to stumble and a lot of people to struggle through God being actively working within creation and, and being actively working in our lives and how that even makes us glad and leads to our success is the recognition that God's works are outside of us. And even at times outside of our understanding. Verse 5 says, O Lord, how great are thy works. And thy thoughts are very deep. Obviously we understand at a very surface level that God's works are great. But from... A, a deeper dive that we take into this verse and coupling it with the thoughts are very deep is the fact that when God works, God works in ways that are far above us. And he does this as an omniscient God, as a God who knows all things, as an eternal God who is outside of time, as a God who not only knows the present and the past, but also knows the future. A God who has the capability of working all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, when we view things, we view them in a very finite way. We view them pretty much purely from our perspective and how we think things may turn out. Whereas God works in a way where he knows the end result, he knows the future, he knows what we need, and he acts accordingly to this. This is, again, where people struggle, because people think, well, how is God working in this way good? It doesn't feel good to me right now. It doesn't seem good right now. But nevertheless, as time passes and time moves on, we can look back retrospectively in a lot of those times and, and see, you know, this really was good. This is how God intended to work in my life. This did turn out for my good. Even though in the moment it didn't feel like it, I'm thankful that God's ways are great and that his ways are above mine and that his thoughts are deep and outside of my thoughts because he has the whole picture. He's painting the whole picture. He's already painted the whole picture. He knows it. He's sovereign. He's perfect. He knows everything. This is where we build off of God's loving kindness and faithfulness. Because we need to have faith in those two things. Have faith in his loving kindness and, and have faith in his faithfulness. And that God's works are planned and thought out and great. Because again, like I said, sometimes we perceive that God isn't working. Or that God is working in a way that isn't good. But look how verses 6 and 7 describe those who don't understand the concept of God's ways being outside of our ways. 
It says, A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when as the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is they that shall be destroyed forever. Primarily in verse 6, we see the description of the man that doesn't comprehend that God's works are good. That God's works, even though they uh, may not always seem good in our current situation, but his ways are great. His thought process is far beyond our thought process. It describes them as the brutish man. Or the senseless man. It describes him as a fool. We need to make sure that we're keeping that clear picture in our mind, the clear understanding in our mind that God is working, and God is working things for good. He expresses his loving kindness, and he's faithful within that, and these things cannot clash. They cannot contradict, which is another great aspect of, of thankfulness that we can give to God is the fact that God's working will never contradict God's loving kindness. Rather, they all work together in a perfect way because he's a perfect God. The third thing that we can be thankful for is thankful for God's glory. Thankful for God's glory in verses 8 through 11. But thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered, but my horn shall thou exalt, like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be an anointed with fresh oil. Mine eyes also shall see my desire of mine enemies, and my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that shall rise up against me. The psalmist turns his attention from God's action now to God's glory, with the recognition of God being on high forevermore, being the most high forevermore. What the psalmist is acknowledging here is God's eternal preeminence in all things. In every single way, God is the most high. At every single time, God is the most high. Whether it seems like things are going good, like things are going bad, where it feels like the enemy is losing or it feels like the enemy is winning, nevertheless, the Lord is still the most high. Nevertheless, he always will be the most high. And this extends over the enemies of God and those who oppose God. Verse 9, For lo, thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. We've, we've touched on this as we've gone through the Psalms of how there are many times where it feels like the wicked and the evil and the ungodly prosper. And they prosper far greater than the godly do. But this is where we have faith that the Lord is still the Most High. And that even though there are people that oppose God and people that oppose God's way and people that, that work wickedly, they're not only enemies of God but oppose God completely, their end is will be of those that perish. The workers of iniquity will be scattered. And the reason for thankfulness is not only is God victorious, but as his children, we will also be exalted and victorious in our lives. Because verse 10, it says, But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eyes also shall see my desire on mine enemies, and my ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that shall rise up against me. Because God is high, because God is the most high, and he's the most high forevermore, and because of his glory... Not only does God succeed and God victorious, but as an extension, as his children, are we also those who will be exalted, also those who will be victorious as we serve him. That we'll see those who oppose the way of the Lord 
And that's really what this is referring to. It's not just us as in general, right? We can hold to ways that should not be exalted because we are not perfect people. But if we're holding to the ways of the Lord and living for the Lord, we see that those ways will be exalted. And if that's the, the outpouring of our heart and the, the main thrust of our life, then that will be exalted and that will come up as victorious. We should be thankful for God's glory and the fact that ultimately he is, and by extension we are, victorious in our lives. But fourth and, and finally this morning, we could be thankful for God's blessing. Thankful for God's blessing. Verses 12 through 15. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. The show that the Lord, to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. As the psalmist continues, that not only will God's children be exalted and victorious, but they will also be blessed. And he describes this for us in two ways. The first way is like a palm tree. Flourish like a palm tree. Now, think about a palm tree and where they typically find palm trees. Palm trees don't typically are up in this area, but rather they tend to be in tough environments, heat-induced environments, where it's not always the easiest place to flourish. This is a very good example for us that if we are going to flourish like the palm tree, this means that we can still flourish even in these warm, intense, tough environments that life may put us into, or that we may be put into in life. Even though we may have difficulties, even though we may be in a tough environment, because of God and because of his blessing, we are still able to flourish, just like the palm tree. But we see that we could also grow like the cedars. Now the cedars of Lebanon were oftentimes the strongest wood that was available for building in that time. And they were a picture and a symbol of strength and stability. Which allows us to, to glean from that. That when it says that we will grow like the cedars from Lebanon, that because of the Lord's blessing in our life, this allows us to be strong. This allows us to be resilient, not because of ourselves, not because of what we can do, but rather because of God's blessing. We then see a turn from these physical blessings to spiritual blessings. In verse 13, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Again, we see the spiritual blessing as those who are planted in the courts of the Lord, that they will flourish and that they will produce fruit in their lives. These are those who maintain a close relationship with God. As we seek to maintain this close relationship with God, this allows us to thrive spiritually. This allows us to flourish spiritually. But it's all about the close relationship that we have with God. It doesn't just happen. It's not just purely because we're God's children, but because we are actively pouring ourselves into this relationship. This allows us to flourish and produce fruit. And we see in verse 15 that the overall purpose is that we may declare or give all the glory to God. To show that the Lord is upright. That he is our rock. That there's no unrighteousness in him. This passage closes with the fact that our thankfulness gives God glory. That his character, who he is, what he does, and how that affects us, 
shows his glory. His uprightness shows his glory. The fact that he is our rock shows his glory. The fact that there is no unrighteousness in him shows his glory. This is what drives our thankfulness. So as we conclude this morning, is your thankfulness an active or a passive thankfulness? Are you allowing your thankfulness to be determined by the things that make you happy as they may or may not happen in your life? Or are you active in your thankfulness? Are you actively thanking God for what he's done as the only true invariable source of thanksgiving? Is your thanksgiving rooted in circumstance or is it rooted in God? Are you thankful for God's character, for his loving kindness, for his faithfulness? Are you thankful for his action, even if it may be above our comprehension, even though it may not be what we think is the right thing? You have faith and knowing that what God does is the right thing. Are you thankful for God's glory? Are you thankful that he is the most high? That he will be victorious? And as an extension of his victory, we too will be victorious. Are you thankful for his blessing? Are you thankful for how he allows us to flourish like the palm tree and grow like the cedar of Lebanon? Are you thankful that we're able to thrive spiritually as we plant ourselves close to him? If we are, we will find ourselves in a group that is being actively thankful, that is expressing thanksgiving not only as good things happen, not only in the month of November, but at all times, understanding that this gives God's glory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the psalmist who wrote this. Lord, being inspired by you, very clearly laying out for us so many ways that we can be thankful. Lord, we thank you that you are an invariable God, that you are a perfect God, that you are a faithful God, that you show to us loving kindness. Lord, and that through you we can have so many things. Lord, just describe best for us in Scripture that we can have life and have it more abundantly through you. So I thank you for that. I pray that you would help us to apply these things to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.